All right, Cedar, thank you for having me um, and inviting me out to, to speak out, John. Um, look, like John said, my name is Alan Derriard. I'm a full-time football agent and I currently run the largest player agency in Australia, Elite Football, with my dad. We started the agency about eight years ago. I'll touch on a few things. I'll touch on my story, um, maybe Rico's story. Rico doesn't want me to embarrass him too much, so I'll try not to. That's a lie. Um, and a few other things, but didn't bring the presentation, not here to sell anything, just trying to give free advice. I just encourage any of you guys, as we go along and I'm talking, if you guys have any questions and whatnot, just put your hand up and we can just go through it because it's gonna be very likely the same question you have, someone else is gonna have as well. But start off with just how we started Elite Football. So like many of you guys, I was 15, 16, 17, wanting to play professional football, living in Australia based on the Gold Coast, playing MPL at the time, and I just felt like there was no real pathway set in stone. Like, didn't feel like I was ever gonna make it from the under 18s to the resis to the first team. It always felt like they were always bringing new people in. It always felt like they were sort of preferring 30 year olds, 25 year olds and whatnot to play in that first team, which is, you know, common in football. And was a bit disheartened with the Australian system, as I'm sure maybe a lot of you guys may be feeling. And so at the time, like most people, I remember speaking to dad and I was like, what can I do? You know, I've got this dream, I wanna do something, what can we do? Like most people, you know, you start to, well, what contacts do we have, right? Who do I know that has an academy? Who do I know that has access to a professional team or something? And like the majority of the population, it's uh, a friend of a friend. Oh, I know this guy that once went here and this and that. And well, that's what happened to me, right? And we knocked on a few doors and ended up getting a trial going overseas to Spain at 17. And unfortunately for me, what happened, um, like a lot of people, I was scammed. So it was an academy that sort of promised you know, the world to me, yeah, we're gonna sign you, we're gonna send you to trial on all these different professional clubs, we're gonna do this, this and that. And ultimately when I went over, obviously there was a lot wrong and, you know, empty promises. And unfortunately it's something that is happening to thousands, hundreds of thousands of players every year. And so disheartened when I came back and realized, you know, what it was, speaking to dad, I was like, we need to, surely there's a better way. Surely there's, this isn't just it and whatnot. The following year, I decided to go by myself to trial right, to different teams. This time I went throughout Spain, throughout Portugal, pretty much just cold emails, DMs, any players that I played with, like where you're playing out, messaging people and just trying to get trials everywhere. So it was a bit easier for me because English is my second language, so Spanish comes easier to me. But even then I realized that trying to get something from these clubs, even trialing and, and spending heaps of money, spent heaps of my money, spent heaps of my parents' money. No one really gave an F about me or anyone, right? Because they're so used to having all these amateur players go through the doors and you're just really another number. And there was nothing really concrete to ever happen, right? But something that I noticed while I was sort of out in those travels and had that experience is that, you know, you make connections, you make friends, you start talking to players that actually signed at the club. And the one thing they all sort of had in common was they were all represented by someone. So they were like, oh, here, here's my agent's number. Here's this guy that helped me get here. The issue for me was that when you start messaging these people, they sort of tell you, well, we don't work with amateur players unless you've had a professional contract and something that I can sort of show to clubs, I can't help you, right? And so didn't really get me far. After sort of two years of realizing, you know, for personal reasons, um, uh, you know, I was offered a third division contract in Spain. It wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted to live, you know, it wasn't as good as the club that Rico's signing out. Uh, he doesn't know the real struggles. But uh, I decided to turn it down. The reason I decided to turn it down was because living in Australia, our life here is really, it's awesome, right? We can't really complain. We have access to everything. We have got access to uni, access to whatever we want to do. And so for me, I wasn't willing to put in the grind of the third division when you're there it's a different sort of ball game. But I came back and I remember sat with dad and I go, what can we do to sort of fix this? At the time he had an academy called Elite Football Academy where it was just trainings. And I said, there's, there's a gap in the market and no one's really looking out for those amateur players to actually transition into the pro scene because the agents, they only care about the professional players because it's easier, right? It's easier to pick off a professional player that's already had a contract and try and sell them off and make a quick buck, right? And so that's how Elite Football got created. With a few contacts that I made in my journeys, we started off with just you know one or two clubs at the start. And the sole focus of what we do in my agency now is to 
help those amateur players. The players just like me that live in Australia or maybe some other country that you just never got that chance to break through, never got that professional contract, doesn't mean the talent's not there. Doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just really, at the end of the day, a lack of access. Flash forward seven, eight years now, we're the largest agency in Australia. We work with over 25 professional clubs and we've signed a bunch of players, Australian players, to professional contracts and scholarships in Spain, just like Rico recently has. So a couple of things that I wanted to just talk about, because I'm sure it's gonna give you guys value. When players come to me, a lot of the time, they say, look, I, I wanna be a professional footballer. Obviously, everyone's journey is going to be different. And striking you guys all with just the same stroke, in my opinion, with all the players we've sent and with the clubs that we work with, there's two real main ways to go pro. One is the players that wanna go as high as possible, players that wanna play in your first division, your second divisions, that's their dream. And then the other ones that come to me and they go, look, I wanna be super realistic. You know, I've only got a small period of window, I'm 22 and that's what I've got, right? To talk a bit about what to expect, whether you go through us or you go through anyone overseas and you're going to a first or a second division club, the way their funnel works is like this, and this is the funnel that Rico experienced. You land there and you're an international player, right? So they're not gonna just throw you into the deep end and, and start training with their youth team or their first team, right? It's not gonna happen. You get in there and they've got built-in systems, uh, a team called like the international area, right? And this is an, an area of players just like you trialing from all over the world. It's a way where clubs make money right? I'm very transparent. These clubs make money off these international players. So they charge you a fee for your accommodation, your food and all that sort of stuff. And at the same time, they get lucky sometimes when a Rico comes along and they sign them for the year for free. They don't have to pay a club anything. It's a win-win situation for the clubs, right? So the higher clubs have that system where you go in, it's an international area. You've got to show yourself, you've got to train, you've got to perform with this team and then you slowly get invited to train with their youth team. Once they start seeing you there, you get invited to train with maybe their under 19s. Then maybe you get invited to train with their C team, et cetera, et cetera, right? Bigger clubs, division ones, division twos, they have a lot of access within that same club. You might not make the under 19s, but you may make their C team. If you don't make their C team, a lot of them also have sister clubs in the region, right? Where they maybe own 60% of a sister club and that sister club, you know, is practically theirs. And so if they like you and they see potential in you because you're young, but you're not quite ready for the C team or their under 19s is, is full or something, they buy you and then they loan you out to that sister club, right? For a year or something. So when you trial up high, there's a lot of access, right? That's sort of the main way if you're wanting to go, if the dream is to go as high as possible. If you want the most realistic, you know, I want to get my foot in the door, I want to sign something to then progress, and you're looking at sort of your third division, fourth division, fifth division clubs. The way their funnel works is they are not big enough financially to have that international area. So what they do instead is they just put you straight into their under 19s, right? Now you're not gonna sign for the under 19s, but you'll be training with them. So for a lot of my players, a, a big thing that they say to me is, damn, it's really hard training with and showing myself in the international area, like you'd know Rico, because you've got some players that are really good and some players that are really bad. And so a lot of players struggle because it's like, Oh, if I'm not playing around good players, I play worse. So the good thing about going low is that you avoid that. You're going straight into the under 19s and training with them or their resis or whatever, right? The problem with that is, and Rico can probably tell you, when you're avoiding that funnel, these players that you're training with, you're there to steal a spot, right? And it's not as friendly as, as Australia is. So when you're going into those teams, that's when you really come up against sort of interesting characters that don't want you to steal their position or their friend's position, right? It's football at the end of the day. So while it might be easier in, one, in some ways, it's definitely harder in other, others, right? So those are the two sort of ways to expect if you were to go overseas. The other thing I wanna sort of leave you guys with is whether you're going through us or anyone, it's just three things to avoid. Right? I want to make it my life's work for no other player to ever get scammed, no other player to ever have a bad experience. If there's anything I can do in this world, it, it's that. So the three things to avoid are one, scams, two, academies, and three, tours. Now I'll explain the three now. The first one is scams. What do I mean by scams? Well, could be an agent, could dress like me, look exactly like me and, and promise you the world and convince you to go somewhere and whatever, right? 
you obviously have no knowledge whether what they're doing is the right way or the wrong way or if they're going to scam you or not that's the unfortunate thing about being in your position is that you don't have the knowledge that say i would have right which is why these things happen a lot of the times people that scam don't even know they're scamming you so it could be a friend of a friend and they go yeah i know this guy that knows someone that is playing in this club right and so they send you there and you feel safe because it's someone it's a family friend and they feel safe because it's a family friend that they have over there and no one really knows what's going on in the industry but really they're just taking you for a ride it's just sort of expensive training so i really want people to do their research on when you go with anyone that is an agent or an academy or whatever from here to go overseas whatever you do really have a look at have they signed players do they have testimonials do they show what they do I have a lot of players that come to me and they go, yeah, so I, yeah, I spoke to three or four of your players. Rico, you probably get players that message you about elite football, right? Because they see you on the Instagram. Okay, do that. Message the other players. If they have nothing to hide, do a little bit of work and you're gonna save yourself a lot of pain and time and money. And unfortunately right now, you guys don't have that much time. So besides the bad experience, you really only have a, a window, right? If you're 17, 16, how old are you guys, 16, 17? You only have until you're 23 really, to make something happen. Seems like a lot of time, but John will tell you, it just goes by in two seconds, right? So that's the first one. That's what I mean by scams. Tied to that is academies. Now, academy is a word that gets thrown around pretty easily. It's been in the industry for a long time. You're gonna see a lot of people here that have academies and whatnot, and they wanna send you overseas, but they don't actually send you directly with the professional clubs. So at Elite Football, we don't work with any academies. When we send a player overseas, we send them directly with the club, right? A lot of people are gonna send you, or they, where they do send you is, for example, Barcelona Academy, right? And so it looks like it's Barcelona and they're wearing the same kit as Barcelona, but you go overseas and it's just some random dude that has bought the licensing rights of Barcelona to use their image and whatever to sell it as a program for training. That's what I mean by academies. And a lot of academies here that send players overseas, that's the system they work. That's why you don't see any player ever signing there. It's not because we, don't have, we have a lack of talent in Australia. That's not true. In Australia, we have a lot of talent. We just don't have the access. And when people go overseas, 90% of them are going to things like this. And so nothing's ever gonna come out of it. That's the second thing to look out for. The third thing I wanna leave you with is tours. If you guys have seen, I'm sure you've seen like, two week UK tour, you know, we'll play against three or four clubs. Has anyone ever gone overseas, by the way? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, on a tour. Just your hand up on a tour. On a tour, okay. Good experience though, yeah? Fun? Yeah. How old were you? Six. Sixteen. Okay, so I have very strong opinions by all this, as you can tell, because I've been in that position and I know what it feels like to, to get jammed like that. With tours, okay, I would not recommend anyone over the age of 12, maybe 13 to go on a tour. And only if you understand that it's only gonna be experience-based, just to have a look at the culture and have a look at playing against some random teams. If you can afford it and you wanna do it, go through your life. I think it's gonna be a great experience for little kids and, and whatnot. If you're older than 13 and you're wanting to have a real pathway, whether it's you know, to be seen or to make it as a professional, tours are the biggest scam, I think, in the industry right now. People are charging upwards of $35,000 for two weeks and it's just absolutely ridiculous, right? So those three things I would say to avoid um, and just have a think if you are wanting to go overseas and trial is obviously, again, the scams, don't go through a friend of a friend of a friend because they have just about as much knowledge as you do on what's actually happening. Academies and then the tours. Now, I would also add to that, don't do what I did, which was go by myself and <laughs> knock on doors and send cold DMs and whatnot. You definitely can. That is something you can do. The thing that is hard to explain there is that once you're in the industry and you are talking to these professional clubs, you can start filtering through them. Now, for example, when I go and I talk to a club and I ask them what they want from a player, what they want from me, what they're interested in, I can start filtering through clubs that are only interested in money. Clubs that go, look, we don't actually want international players. 
Like, we're here, if they come, we make a good money, but we're never gonna sign anyone. That happened. We're gonna blur this out, Benny, but I just signed with in my last trip, haven't promoted it yet, exclusive announcement. They're wanting, for example, 3,000 euros a week. So I'm never gonna send anyone there unless they're 13 and they want an experience. Because they told me, very clear as day, we don't need international players. We have quality players, we're not interested. But if they wanna come and they wanna experience they wanna do this and that, yeah, this is what it costs, right? So a lot of my work in the last eight years is not only just avoiding all these academies and scams and whatnot, but is actually signing with clubs that I've been very clear with what we want elite football and they've been very clear with what they want, right, in the partnership. That's why I think that you shouldn't go on your own. You probably should look for an agent if you are wanting to go overseas or look for someone you trust. Again, it doesn't have to be elite football because they're going to save you that. They're going to save you the, you know, if an academy is going to mess you up, there also is some clubs that you're going to go direct and it's also just going to be an experience. Unfortunately, Football's a business like any other. Any questions? Just a quick one. So yes. We obviously, as a, our students go through what we call our IDP, so we look at themselves as footballers, technical, tactical, physical, psychological. Mm -hmm. You're looking at obviously these guys in Europe. What are some areas that you think that we are lacking in Australia, or these guys around this age really need to maybe focus on if they think they're going to push themselves over in Europe? <coughs> maybe some key two or three areas that definitely need to be improved. Okay. Rico, what do you think? You've been to two different clubs? <clears throat> Definitely concentration, mm -hmm. like psychological, you've got to be mentally prepared. Um, technical wise, you've got to be able to, I don't know, you've got to be able to play out of tight situations. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's a good main point that Rico brings up. A lot of the times, Parents and players come to be like, oh, here's my highlights, here's my CV. Do you think I got a shot? I hate that. I hate that question. That's like the worst question. I hate answering. I almost never answer it. Because while your highlights might look good, while, you know, you might look amazing, until you get over there and you're away from your family, you're away from your friends, your PlayStation, your girlfriend, your dog, whatever it is, that's the only time we're going to know, you know, how the cookie crumbles. And you probably see it. You might know players that perform really well here. They get over there and they just crack. And vice versa, there's players that don't perform that well here, they get away from the distractions because maybe they don't have a great home environment and they just flourish. So in terms of what I would say is something common that clubs, you know, sort of pick up from our players, they love the strength in Australia, they love the speed. I've been very fortunate, a lot of my players are very uh, humble, uh, very well taken care of, they're very disciplined, so there's never really been too many disciplinary. Uh, stuff from the club, but they do look at a lot of that stuff as well. It would mainly be the technical side of players. So two main things I really get is technique and um, mistakes. And so I think because the game is a bit faster there, it's the same game, right? So it's still just one ball, but because they're moving at a faster pace, you have less time to think about your next pass. You have less time to think about where you're going to position yourself, less time to think about what you're going to do, right? So other players really take about a month and a half to just adapt to that speed. And what happens in that period is they do make mistakes. And unfortunately, mistakes are sort of the difference between getting something from a club and not. Um, like I was telling John before, a lot of players want to go overseas and they want to show themselves, they want to run, they want to take players on. That's not what they're interested in. When you go to professional clubs, they, they can pick you out within the, like the first half an hour, like your first training session. Rico, when he went to Celta, was one of the few players that he went there day one, day two, you're already training with their youth team, right? Okay, that doesn't happen to every player. Some players are a month in that international side. So they're not dumb. They know what to look for. You don't have to show yourself. So Rico, when he first came to us, was about two years ago. He attended our Melbourne event. At the time, we brought just Celta de Vigo, first division Spanish club, and he funnily enough, injured himself on the first day. So he only really showed, was it second day or first day? First day. So towards the end of the first day, he injured himself. But like I mentioned, these clubs, they can pick players up within the first 30 minutes, really. They saw Rico, he was young, he was strong, he did everything right. He was just unlucky to sort of roll his ankle, right? He was probably thinking about something else. They still invited him to go overseas to see how he would perform over there. He went over. Like I mentioned, 
hit the ground running. Not many players do. And I've had players that sign that just take longer to adapt. So it's not like a key thing, but it's something that I think is important to know for you guys to sort of compare yourself to Rico's level, right, mentally. He did really well. We were actually in talks with Celta for a while to try and get a signature over the line. Unfortunately, certain things, not because of Rico's fault, fell through and we couldn't make that happen. Came back after another year. We had another event here in Melbourne. This time uh, is our actually last event in January. And this time we brought three clubs. We brought Celta again. We brought a club called Real Oviedo, second division in Spain. And we brought another club called Real Avila, third division. Um, we forced each club to sort of pick players to sponsor. So across three events, they chose nine players to sponsor. Rico performed in Melbourne and had actually not only Real Oviedo, but he had the interest of Celta, Real Oviedo and Real Avila wanting him. I convinced him this time to go to Real Oviedo. Actually, I, I, don't even, I didn't even talk to you. I spoke to your dad and he told me that I didn't even need to speak to you because you were upset with Celta. So he ended up picking Real Oviedo, second division team, went over there for a month. I'm, I'm really making this very broad because I'm not Rico. And after a few sort of conversations, you know, um, I managed to get him to, you know, go s skip the international area and go straight in with their under 19s to train. Played in the Oviedo Cup as well within the, in the international, so you could really show himself. So that month was really packed, so he didn't really need to be there longer. And well, the rest is history. He was offered a one year contract, which he's accepted, and we won't go into the terms, so I don't embarrass him. Yes. While he's over there, or like with Self or Oviedo this time, what's What's your role? Are you sort of checking in with him sort of each week, seeing how it's going, or checking with the club? Mm -hmm. You sort of have sort of key things that you, you want to see <coughs> the club about while he's over there. So yeah, what's, I suppose what's your role while he's there trialing? Yeah, yeah. Good question. So our role with elite football with when the players go overseas, um, something that I think really separates us from competition, um, we have a team. I've got um, admin people that work with us, media guys, I've got support agents, I've got dad as well. So there's a lot of people behind elite football that are constantly supporting our athletes. Um, it's not just me. I'd love to say it was just me, but that, that'd be lying. We do check up on, you know, on our players and see how they're doing and whatnot. The bulk of our work would be to stay in communication with the club. So especially me and Maurice, because we're technically just the agents and the, the people signing the paperwork. The bulk of our work is just constant communication with all the clubs we work with to just, at the end of the day, it's like anything, right? If you like someone, if you have a good relationship with someone, you know, if you want to hang out with someone, it, that, that's all life is really about. And as you grow up and you, you move into the world, you're going to understand that, you know what, even some of these probably have like casual jobs, yeah? Have you noticed that maybe there's people that get away with doing less work because they're friendlier with the managers than maybe you are? Right, well, the real world is exactly like that. There's people that feel like they can get away with stuff because they've got better relationships with the people that can actually decide things. So we focus a lot on our relationship with the clubs because at the end of the day, that's only going to benefit our players, you know? It doesn't benefit Rico as much as me sending him a message or calling him being, hey bro, what's up? Any, anything good? Like, anything bad I need to know about? Him going, oh yeah, Alan, all good. This is my Rico impression. No, nothing, nothing bad. Yeah, thanks for checking up. That's not as great, right? But if I'm constantly talking to Oviedo and I'm like, hey, how's Rico doing? What's this? Are, we, are you doing anything with Rico? Are we gonna move him to a different club? You know, put different sort of pressures. Obviously, I don't wanna fully go into it, but that's mainly what we're doing is to try and make sure that he's gonna be looked after Oviedo and they're gonna, from now, keep consideration for the next year. And is he moving up? Is he doing X, Y, Z? Or do we have to think about moving him to one of our other partners, et cetera? Okay. So I suppose then taking a step back, you're, and you're telling me you were in Melbourne for two days, and you're just going bang, 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 meeting here, uh, over to the... What's your, what's your year look like? Like how often are you in Europe? Is it sort of a real vast role that, that sort of... And I suppose what's your pathway into that? Like going get your agent's licence? Is there any other calls you need to do to tick along and get those sort of things? Yep, good question. Agent licence, fun fact, I don't have one. Um, you, don't, it's, you don't need to legally go through the FIFA exam to be an agent. Um, actually, I was talking to someone else the other day about this. When you do go through the FIFA exam, you get that agent license, they actually regulate you so much, not in terms of 
you know, doing the right things, you know, our contracts for our players, only three and five percent. We still maintain within what FIFA wants, even though it's not necessarily illegal. Like someone can put a 50 percent contract in front of you. FIFA can't do anything about it, but we like to play by their rules still. But they regulate you in other things. But what I was mentioning before about the team that we're building and wanting to work in more than just one country, having people under us that talk to the players and whatnot. I would need them all to do regulating work for them. And so that's why I haven't gone down that path yet because they want to keep pl uh, agents individualized, right? In terms of pathway, I get a lot of DMs and emails from players that are, or students that are at uni and whatnot. And they message me, hey, I see what you do. You're an agent. How can I get into it and whatnot? Definitely stuff I'm going to be talking more about. But really, it's, it is a very tough world to get into, I won't lie. I probably wouldn't recommend a lot of people to get into it because it does require, you know, like with most things, I guess, when you're wanting to actually get more than just work with just more than one club or one player or a few players or something, if you're wanting to work with a lot, you're constantly gonna be traveling, your schedule's out of whack, you'll be picking up the phone at random times, you know, I don't get off the phone sometimes till 11 at night. Um, things like this happen where I go, yeah, I'll be in Melbourne Tuesday and then come to one thing and all of a sudden I've got, I've got to stay another three days because I've got another six meetings to get, get to, right? So not complaining, love what I do, worked really hard to get here. Obviously, it's been a period of eight years, but even the people that are higher than me that only work with professional athletes, a lot of the times you find that their agents, they get treated almost like... Um, for lack of a better word, like servants, you know? So a lot of the professional athletes that you see, like Tony Cruz and whatnot, his agent, he sort of milks him to go to the shops and get stuff for him. Oh, can you pick up my kids from school? Can you do this? Can you do that, right? So it's an industry that you, you probably wouldn't think that that stuff happens. You think our agent only works at the club and negotiates and whatnot, but once that contract's done and a player's there for three years and the player's still paying him money, they sort of use him to do other stuff. So bit different for what we do because like I said we focus on amateur players and trying to get them across the line from the beginning that's something I, I never want to let go of but in the future as we transition to have a department that focuses on professional athletes that's what's to be expected if you're thinking of potentially wanting to work in football the agent life will be a lot of phone calls a lot of late nights if you're working with overseas and you just have to be really good at just talking to people and just really trying to make friends within the business I would say. Did you have to study for this? No. No, no. So that's the study thing is a very interesting thing. For example, I've had two businesses before Elite Football. I had a finance business and another business that I probably shouldn't say in front of students. With both of them, with the finance one, for example, I was working with big financial firms like eToro, Stake. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. Not once did they ever ask me for any licenses. Not once did they ever ask me for, you know, if I can give financial advice in the internet, any of that stuff. So nothing was illegal, but there's a lot of things you can do in this world without needing a university degree. Like obviously make sure that, you know, you're not gonna operate on something without being a doctor, but there's a lot of things that just don't need that. At the end of the day, what people just want from you is the value that you bring to the table. A lot of people that I've hired to work for me is not the players or the people that come up and they say, how do you get into an agent role? or can you give me advice on being an agent? I usually don't even respond to those messages. But the people that go, hey, I wanna become an agent, what can I do for you? What can I, how can I start helping? How can I get involved? A lot of people are like right now doing my email marketing and they're only 19, 20, because they just wanna be around, they wanna learn, they wanna ask questions. And so you find that people have all the time in the world when you're willing to sort of give them something and to get into industries. And that's probably what I would suggest is you don't need to study. You just need to place yourself and just provide whatever value you can to them. Yep. Uh, what's the best way to like really approach? Because you were talking about how people DM you. Mm -hmm. and really, uh, what's it, what's it, what's it, what did you say? Respond? Yeah, respond. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the best way to really approach? Approach clubs? Approach. Uh, or agent. agent? In terms of you wanting to become an agent or you wanting to be with them to sort of go overseas? So it's like anything. Search up agencies, right? You might have elite football, you might have some other people on Instagram or media and whatnot. And then just message and be very clear about what you want as well, what you're looking for. And then I would just filter through like, 
maybe you don't get responses, it, it might happen, but really if it's an agency that's working with amateur players or promotes that, everyone should respond to you. Um, and it's just about showing eagerness and, and make sure you have a CV, make sure you have highlights, you know, like Rico I don't think has highlights. So I got him a contract without even highlights. So it's not, it's not necessary. Um, usually a CV is enough and like we make play CVs anyways. Even with highlights, just tuck, touching on that topic, forget about the 10 minute long highlights. No professional club is looking at your highlights for 10 minutes. They're probably gonna look at the first 30 seconds. Like that's just the truth. So make sure you've got the best of the best in this first minute, because that's all they're ever gonna watch, just so you're aware. Unless you get to Rico stage and then money's involved, et cetera, et cetera. Right, to answer your question? Yeah, DMs, you'll get responses. Um, my business card's there, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you should be fine, you should be fine. And then just, just talk and I'd work with someone that you like, because potentially you're gonna be working with them for two, three years. And if you don't like how they're responding to you when you're not paying him or nothing's signed, you're not gonna like how he works when you're signed. You get me? Okay. You talk a lot to these guys about not only the stuff they do on the pitch, but the stuff they do off the pitch and stuff. Like <laughs> these clubs in Europe, what are they looking for for their under 19 academy players? Obviously, if they see them, if they're living on, on residence and stuff like that, what sort of things are they looking at as the key things that, that, that might make or break a trial? Or... Yep. Two things like we mentioned before, um, you know, obviously if you're a baller, you're a baller, right? Like a lot of these stuff, a lot of the football world, it, it's a lot of it's common sense. You just sort of need someone like me or someone like a club to sort of say the same thing to you. But like in general, we all sort of know what we need to do. Like we know, you know that you need to go to the gym, right? You know that you need to work out, you know you need to eat healthy, you know you need to, like everyone knows what they should be doing. It's just about doing that, right? And clubs don't really, like they differ. Like I was talking to you before, different clubs are looking for different players right and how they program them but across the board like if you're if you're a baller if you have it then you start to focus on making sure that you're not making mistakes making sure that um, a big thing I like to promote is charisma right same way I was saying if you want to work for someone you got to really have those relationship as a football player the same thing you know Rico doesn't talk but he's likable right I hope he's a nice guy right and a lot of my other players that have been signed, they have that charisma where not only are they ballers, but they're also there and they're joking around with the coaches, you know, picking up cones, making it very apparent that they're humble, not yelling at their teammates. All these, all these little things that just add up and then all of a sudden those coaches go, even, even in Celta, there's coaches that message me like, oh, it'd be good to get Rico back and this and that, right? Because they fall in love with the person not just the player. And you have to make yourself in the forefront of people's minds when you're there. You gotta really capitalize, not just the football, but really, you know, make people m wanna miss you if you leave. They don't, wanna, they don't wanna see you go. So now it's not just me telling the clubs, oh, we need to get Rico a contract. You've also got other coaches going to the head scout, going to the higher ups and go, look, we really think Rico would mesh really well with our team, right? This is just an example. It didn't happen with Rico, I worked very hard, but with other players, it happens. So that's the sort of stuff that you sort of, it's, it's those little extras, like the charisma, mistakes, don't, you don't need to take on heaps of players, just do the simple things, they can see your level in that, right? A big one, and, it's, and we talk about it a lot as, as coaches, is sometimes the parents, are you at an age that when you meet the parents, and you, is there parents that you go, well that's actually gonna affect the players' ability and chances, where the parents, you talk about before, when they have the realities, out of whack. As there families that you will go, I'm oh, sorry, I can't, I can't work for you, I can't present you because of maybe their unrealistic expectations and things like that? Yes, I would maybe say people don't have unrealistic expectations from my experience coming when they come towards us, but you can tell those helicopter parents. And usually, from my experience, it's the dads that also coach a team on the side or something, or the dads that maybe coached the, their son, right? And what we struggle with is obviously we know what the clubs want, we know what we wanna to feed to the player, but if the player's listening to dad in what they should be doing on the pitch, sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect on that and usually there's, there's been really quality players, players that in the past, like even now they're playing first team at South Melbourne, like the, you know, I used to work with where their dads were really, you know, brought them back, even though they were trying to help and it just comes from a 
place of love. Um, when parents don't let us do our jobs, it, it gets a bit messy. So yeah, it, it does happen. And um, at the start, we accepted everyone. At the now, with the position we're in, it's those type of plays I won't take on, but I pass them off to another agent that's under me that's just maybe learning and has more patience than me. <laughs> Ty, is there anything you'd like to say before we wrap up? I uh, just say just thank you for coming down. I guess it's been appreciated as everyone really looked forward to you coming. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah.